Imagine you're looking at a mysterious bag filled with colored balls, red, green, and blue, and you need to figure out what proportion of each color is inside. Maybe it's 40% red, 30% green, and 30% blue, or perhaps it's 10% red, 20% green, and 70% blue. The thing is, there are countless possible combinations, and each combination is itself a set of probabilities that must sum to 1. This is exactly the kind of problem the Dirichlet distribution was designed to solve, giving us not just one answer, but a whole landscape of possibilities, where some combinations are more likely than others based on what we've observed so far. Before we dive into the Dirichlet distribution, Let's quickly remind ourselves about something simpler that you might already know, the beta distribution. When you're flipping a coin and you've seen 5 heads and 10 tails, you want to model the probability of getting heads on the next flip. The beta distribution is perfect for this because it handles two categories, heads or tails, and it takes two parameters, alpha and beta, which are just your counts plus 1. So with 5 heads and 10 tails, you'd have a beta distribution with alpha equals 6 and beta equals 11. The plus 1 is a mathematical convenience that helps when you haven't seen any data yet, and the beautiful thing is that the peak of this distribution sits exactly at 5 15ths, which is precisely your observed frequency of heads. Now, here's where things get really exciting. Because what happens when you have three categories instead of two? Let's say you're running a small university that offers three majors, mathematics with five students, science with 10 students, and English with 15 students. You want to model the probability that a new student would choose each major, but the beta distribution can't help you anymore because it only has two parameters, alpha and beta, and you need three parameters now, one for each category. This is where the Dirichlet distribution enters the scene and it's essentially the beta distribution's more flexible sibling that can handle any number of categories you throw at it. The Dirichlet distribution takes a vector of parameters, which we call alpha, and just like with beta, these are your observed counts plus 1. So for our university, we'd have alpha 1 equals 6 for math, alpha 2 equals 11 for science, and alpha 3 equals 16 for English. When you draw from a Dirichlet distribution, instead of getting a single probability like you do with beta, you get an entire vector of probabilities, one for each category, and these probabilities always sum to one. You might draw the vector 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, meaning there's a 20% chance for math, 30% for science, and 50% for English, or you might draw a different vector like 0 0.15, 0 0.35, 0 0.5, and the distribution tells you which vectors are more likely given your observed data. The mathematical intuition behind the Dirichlet is surprisingly elegant, where each probability in your vector gets raised to a power that's one less than its corresponding alpha parameter. So P1 gets raised to alpha 1 minus 1, P2 to alpha 2 minus 1, and P3 to alpha 3 minus 1 and then we multiply all these terms together. This is exactly what happens in the beta distribution too, except now we are doing it for multiple probabilities simultaneously. The gamma functions that appear in the normalization constant might look intimidating, but they are just there to ensure that when you integrate over all possible probability vectors that sum to 1, you get a total probability of 1 which is a fundamental requirement for any probability distribution. What makes the Dirichlet distribution particularly elegant is how it behaves as you collect more data. The expected value of each probability in your vector converges to exactly what you'd expect, the observed frequency in your data. The variance of each probability also behaves beautifully, starting relatively large when you have little data and shrinking as you collect more observations eventually converging to the familiar formula p times 1 minus p divided by n, which is exactly what you'd expect from basic statistics. In Bayesian statistics, the Dirichlet distribution plays a crucial role as a prior distribution for categorical data. 
It's what we call conjugate to the multinomial distribution, which means if you start with a Dirichlet prior and observe multinomial data, your posterior is also Dirichlet, just with updated parameters. This mathematical convenience, combined with its intuitive interpretation, makes it invaluable in applications ranging from topic modeling in natural language processing, where each document is a mixture of topics, to computational biology, where we model genetic variations, to consumer preference modeling, where we want to understand how people choose between multiple products. The visual representation of the Dirichlet distribution is particularly beautiful when you have three categories. We can visualize it on a triangular simplex, where each point in the triangle represents a possible probability vector. The three vertices of the triangle represent the extreme cases where one category has probability 1 and the others have probability 0. When you sample from a Dirichlet distribution, you're essentially picking points from this triangle and the distribution tells you which regions of the triangle are more likely. With our university example using parameters 6, 11 and 16, you'd see samples concentrated around a point that corresponds to about 18% math, 33% science, and 48% English. The concentration of the Dirichlet distribution is controlled by your alpha parameters in two beautiful ways. First, the sum of all alphas determines how concentrated your distribution is. Think of it like this. Alpha equals 1, 1, 1 gives you a uniform spread across all possibilities, showing complete uncertainty. Alpha equals 3, 5, 2, with the sum of 10, creates a loose cloud of samples centered around 30%, 50%, 20%. But alpha equals 30, 50, 20, with the sum of 100, creates a tight cluster at the exact same center. The key insight is that the ratios between alphas determine where the distribution is centered, while the total sum controls how tightly it's concentrated there. This is like having a confidence dial. Small sums mean you're uncertain and samples spread widely, while large sums mean you're confident and samples cluster tightly. You can even scale any alpha vector by 10 or 100, and while the center stays exactly the same, the spread becomes dramatically tighter, perfectly capturing how additional observations increase your confidence without changing your best estimate. The connection between the beta and Dirichlet distributions is so fundamental that if you take a Dirichlet distribution with just two categories, it mathematically reduces to exactly the beta distribution. This relationship shows us that the Dirichlet distribution isn't some exotic mathematical construct but rather a natural and inevitable extension of ideas we already understand, waiting there in the mathematical landscape to be discovered and applied to real-world problems, where we need to model uncertainty over probability vectors. And that's basically it for this video. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed this explanation, share your thoughts in the comments below, and subscribe to be up to date with the content I create on this channel. See you next time. Bye-bye.